Welcome back to Think Tech. This is movies you can learn from. And today we're going to talk about Bridge of Spies, which is really a very good movie uh, with Tom Hanks, one of my all-time favorites, and Steven Spielberg, one of the great collaborations in recent movies, especially movies about the greatest generation. We've talked about some of those before. And for this discussion, we have uh, two naval retired officers, uh, Shackley Ruffetto, formerly chief judge of the Second Circuit, and Michael Lilly, uh, also a Navy officer retired, um, and uh, formerly the Attorney General of the State of Hawaii. Welcome to the show, you guys. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. So, Shackley, you go first. This Bridge of Spies is a really compelling movie, but it is also very educational, very informative, because it is essentially a true story. Uh, yes, uh, and that's one of the reasons I like it, actually, is it's a it's a, it's a, it's a true story. Uh, um, it's basically about um, the arrest and later exchange of a Soviet spy who was operating in the United States in uh, the late 50s, and uh, the exchange took place in the early 60s. And it's the story of his arrest, trial, conviction, and then and then his exchange later on for a downed American pilot who had been captured by the Soviets during the Cold War. Uh, it was released in October of 2015. And as you mentioned, uh, Tom Hanks is the star of the movie, although the, the acting throughout the movie is just excellent. Um, uh, Steven Spielberg was the director. The Coen brothers, interestingly, wrote it, uh, who you know, went on to do their own movies later on. It takes place during the Cold War. And it's it, interesting to remember that, that during this period of time, you know, the, the Soviets had uh, fired off their first A-bomb in 1949, and you had, you had uh, uh, the, movie, the movie brings us out is that when we all grew up, we were, we were worried and told that there might be a nuclear war. And I remember being, uh, being uh, taught at school to get under the desk and to listen for the air raid sirens and things like that, which people probably laugh about today. But that was very real in those days, and that was the kind of context in which all these things happened. So basically what happened was this uh, Soviet spy named Rudolf Abel, uh, which, is, which was his uh, spy name, his real name was Fisher, actually. Uh, he was operating in a, on a, an atomic secrets um, uh, spy organization in the United States in the late 50s. And he was, he was uh, 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 taking uh, secrets that were being uh, obtained from Los Alamos and other areas of our atomic uh, uh, project and ferreting those to the uh, Soviet Union. And he did that for about 10 years. He was based in New York City. Uh, he was arrested in, uh, let's see, in 1957, and brought into federal courts, and then um, this man James Donovan, who Tom Hanks plays, uh, was a New York lawyer, and he was appointed to represent uh, uh, Mr. Abel uh, during his uh, federal court trial for, uh, for uh, I guess, for his spying activity. Donovan's a very interesting person. He was a former commander in the U.S. Navy during World War II. He was part of the prosecution team at the Nuremberg trials in, in Germany after World War II that prosecuted the Nazi, high, high brass Nazis. And uh, he had been, become an uh, insurance defense lawyer on Wall Street. But he during the war, he'd also been general counsel of the Office of Strategic Services, which was the forerunner of the CIA. And so he, th these people knew him. And we knew he was a good lawyer. And he was drafted to uh, president to uh, put up the defense for uh, Rudolf Abel. And the first half of the movie is always out that. Now, the second half is about the exchange. Uh, where Abel was convicted. He was given 30 years in prison. And so he was available in prison for possible exchange. And, and it apparently is brought out in the movies. Donovan thought about this, and uh, uh, the, it would better not to execute him. Oh, the, the the death penalty was 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 a possibility in this case. At the same time, uh, we uh, Francis Gary Powers was a 
uh, lieutenant in the United States Air Force drafted by the CIA to fly the new Chu reconnaissance spy plane over Russia. He and a group of people were drafted uh, by the CIA. And they, at that time, we didn't have very much photo reconnaissance of what was going on in the Soviet Union. We had some old Lufthansa World War II photographs of the area uh, west of the Ural Mountains, but we really didn't know what else was going on. And because of the height of the uh, concern about nuclear war and nuclear weapons, we wanted to know how many bombers did they have, how many rockets, you know, what was the state of their readiness. Uh, to go to nuclear war. So one of the ways to find that we didn't have, in those days there was no satellites, right? So you have, the only way to find out was to fly airplanes. Initially, they flew around the periphery of the Soviet Union and tried to look in, but you couldn't see very far. So the um, CIA eventually contracted with um, McDonnell Douglas and uh, through the famous skunk, work, skunk works, Kelly uh, 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 Johnson, the famous engineer there, created the U-2 spy plane. Up to that time, the highest an airplane could go would be about 15,000 feet. But the U-2 was designed and actually flew effectively at over 70,000 feet. It was like a big glider with a jet engine. But quite an interesting airplane. There's, they still use it. There's still about 30 of them in the Air Force inventory that fly these flight missions. And so he was he was tasked to fly from uh, Peshawar, Pakistan to Norway. It was the first mission that would cross the entire Soviet Union. And that and as well, they, they thought at that time that the Soviet Union didn't have sufficient uh, uh, surface to air missiles to shoot down an airplane that would fly that high. Turns out they were wrong, of course, and he was shot down. Uh, he uh, he had a uh, I guess a, a quarter was a was a some sort of needle in it that he could have committed suicide, and I guess some say he was expected to do that. But I'm not sure about that. But anyway, he was captured, he was put on trial, and he was convicted, and he was sentenced to prison. I think it was one years in prison. And so, uh, and that was uh, let's see, the exchange. He was shot down on May 1st, 1960. So you had uh, Abel in prison since about 57. So he was sitting in prison. And you had uh, Howard shot down in 1960. And so the CIA asked Donovan to come in and to go to Berlin and to try to negotiate exchange uh, uh, grants to Gary Powers for uh, Rudolph Abel, uh, which he did. And he went there. And uh, that's the second half of the movie, basically. He goes to Berlin. It's a great, great uh, visuals of Berlin. And uh, at that time, they were building the Berlin Wall, and tensions were really high, and things were pretty grim on the east in, in East Berlin. And uh, uh, so he goes there, and and he begins negotiation. Turns out, at the same time that he's arriving there, a young man named Frederick Pryor. Was who was an economic student from Yale, I guess, who who happened to be going to school in East Berlin, and he was picked up by the East Germans, and um, and and uh, Donovan learned about this. So when he begins his negotiations, he says, "Well, I want Rudolf. I want I'll exchange Rudolf Abel for uh, for Francis Gary Powers, but I also want Frederick Pryor." And and part of the drama of the movie is about how how that worked out, about how he was able to finagle back and uh, and get notes of them out eventually. So that's kind of a basic introduction. Uh, there's a lot more to talk about. Uh, uh, so I'll just uh, why don't I just leave it there and we can go move from there. Mike, I have so many questions. I I want to ask you. Uh... But well, let me let me start with some of the things that occur to me after Shackley's uh, description. Um, what does this um, teach us about the Cold War? Maybe you know we have a kind of Cold War going on now. It's not the same. That was the the original Cold War. Just how cold was it? And uh, was it as uh, dangerous as this one? Was it more dangerous? Less dangerous? Uh, it's hard to remember all of it. Shackley's reference to duck and cover, it was it was a nuclear cold war. Um, could we learn anything from this movie about what cold wars are like? Uh, when I was growing up, I, I remember 
that turtle about hide and duck, and uh, we were told to go underneath our chairs as well, and not to look outside because you're you would be blinded by the flash of the bomb. And when I was in Russia about ten years ago, one of my tour guides in Moscow was telling me about how he, as a kid, was taught to hide underneath the school. <laughs> 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 I we had an interesting discussion there. We had a real connection, uh, but I see some real parallels in the Cold War then as Cold War now. Um, but I I think we were a lot more terrified then, and maybe we ought to be a little more terrified today. But um, Steven Spielberg, that was the director of this film, and I are both baby boomers. Uh, I was born in forty six, so I'm one of the earliest baby boomers, and all of us that grew up in the late 50s and early 60s, we all know about powers being shot down as the U-2 over Soviet Union, and somehow he got exchanged or got returned a couple of, a couple of three years later. Um, but we didn't know anything about this spy, uh, Rudolf Abel, and he was the master Soviet spy in the United States at the time, and he'd been there since the 40s. And and, uh, and so he was deeply embedded in the United States. He was one of these guys that if you ran into him, he'd be like a ghost. You wouldn't even see him. He sort of just fit into the background. Um, and that's exactly the character that Mark Rylance, uh, he's one of the greatest I'd say he's one of the greatest actors in the, in the world today. He's certainly the greatest British actor, and he's well-known in Britain because he does theater work mostly on BBC, um, but he became more famous with this. And he also played Thomas Cromwell in the Wolf Hall series. Uh, he's an absolutely incredible actor. Um, Tom Hanks had never uh, worked with him, and when they did the first scene, between them was when Tom Hanks meets him in prison and Hanks goes to Steven Spielberg and says, my God, Mark Rylance, fantastic. And he was, he plays such a subdued character and, and as a subdued character, he's almost like bigger than life. His, his character is just explosive. Um, and Tom Hanks told Spielberg, bake him, please don't let him drag me down. Because Donovan, that he played, is this Irish, ruddy Irishman, and he's, he's a bulldog, and he's got to be tough. And he was afraid that this subdued character would just shrink him down. Uh, and I looked at pictures of the actual uh, Rudolph Abel, and they're almost clones. The, Mark Redlands is almost a clone of of this guy Rudolph, so it, it's a it they're a ama- just an amazing uh, thing. And the Russians did have moles in the United States. He was the greatest. If you've seen the TV series Americans with K, it's about a couple that were embedded in the United States and, and spying on the United States for the Russia. It's similar uh, to that, and and he was actually transmitting uh, intelligence data, as Shackley was pointing out, to the Soviet Union. He was very effective. Um, and then Donovan is a quintessential American. You know, he, he, he tells one guy, you know, the one thing that is different between us and the rest of the world is we have the constitution. And this guy is really, really a constitutionalist and an American. Uh, he actually took the Abel case up to the United States Supreme Court and wound up uh, challenging the search and seizure. And he lost the case 5-4. But that was after only, after after the argued the case, Supreme Court brought it back and asked it to be argued again. So he almost won that case. It was very close. It's a seminal case in search and seizure. Um, and, but this guy is, uh, you know, he's, Donovan is, is just an astonishing and and Hanks is brilliant in it. Uh, Rylance got the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. 
I think he and, in my estimation, he and Hanks were both best actors. I mean, they were, he wasn't just a supporting actor. Um, so, you know, I was mentioning how us baby boomers knew about powers. We didn't know about Abel. Uh, and so that's why when Spielberg found out about this Abel side of the story, he decided, he looked into it, he thought this would be a great movie. Uh, and so this movie is mostly about the characters. It's mostly about Donovan, played by Hanks, and Abel, played by Mark Rylance. And, and Powers is almost like a sub-story of the whole thing, including Pryor, that Shackley was talking about. But there, there are sub-stories. The real story is about these two characters. And as strongly American as Donovan is, he and, and Abel become this these great friends. They and and the friendship is not born out of values, it's born out of respect. They like one another. They like one another as a person. Um people called Abel a traitor, but Donovan said, wait a minute, he's not a traitor. If he was trade if he was American trading American secrets, he'd be a traitor to America. But he was a Soviet that was going after American speaker. That's not a traitor. He's being faithful to the Soviet Union. Uh, we have spies in Russia, and we're doing the same thing. They're not traitors. They're doing their 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 spy craft. So he he respected the fact that he was doing something that that we do in the Soviet Union and, and the other side of the coin. Um, so what happened? What happened to Abel? I liked Abel. I liked the actor. Of course, it was it was great. But I liked him for what he did. I respected him for what he did. I respected him for the way he handled Donovan, Tom Hanks, uh, that I wondered at the end. He, he made these very cryptic but very wise comments to Tom Hanks. It really was well written, this movie. Uh, right, you know, right, every statement of the dialogue. So at, at the end there, he says, uh, uh, Tom Hanks asks him, are you going to be okay when you go back to Russia? And he says, I don't know if, if uh, they, they just put me in the back of the car, that will be, um, you know, a bad thing. And I may not live through that. But if they hug, hug me and shake my hand, uh, then maybe I'll live through it. They don't know what I told the Americans. And so you see at the last moment that I, maybe I didn't watch this carefully enough, they didn't shake his hand. They just put him in the back of the car. Yeah, Do you think happened. he survived? Yeah, he did. Uh, he was reunited. Apparently, he reunited with his wife and daughter, who we, who we talked about, and uh, lived until 1971, and in in Russia. And um, apparently, uh, Donovan had tried to go back later on uh, on a trip to Russia and to and to look him up, but for some reason, it was never never uh, uh, made possible by the by the Soviet authorities, unfortunately. Yeah, well, you know, one thing is uh, the lawyer thing. I wanted to ask you about that, Shackley. So here's a guy, and he has a certain amount of military experience, uh, like a lot of people. Um, but uh, who was it? A a Alan Alda uh, was the senior partner at his firm and approaches him and says, you, you need to do this for your country. He says, what? You know, I'm I'm in the insurance uh, industry. i I don't do that work. I never did that work. I don't want to do that work. And somehow, Alan Walla appealed to him on a patriotic level. And indeed, um, Donovan was a patriot be, be beyond patriot. He took that case and ran with it all the way, including, you know, to uh, to uh, to envelop the trade with the, this fellow Pryor. Uh, that was a remarkable thing, and he stuck with it. Maybe he had this thing about Yale. I don't know. But he was he was determined to do it two for one. And the government was the American government said, Don't do that. We didn't bargain for that. We want one on one, not two for one. And so I, I make him a patriot and and a moral person with enormous, you know, moral values. Um uh, it's part of that greatest generation, isn't it? One interesting vignette in the in the movie that I like was early on. Uh, when your uh, Tom Hanks character is being introduced, he's he's negotiating a, a civil lawsuit with another lawyer in a club or a bar or someplace, and uh, he's he represents the insurance company, and he and the 
the uh, other guy represents five motorcyclists who are apparently uh, hit by a, by a, by a car that uh, Hank's insurance company insured, and and Hank's is saying, "Well, that's one that's one incident, that's one accident," and the other guy saying, "Well, no, it's five because there are five people who are injured, right?" You you've heard that before, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But later on, when he, when he's in Germany and and Berlin, and he's negotiating the release of not one but two people in exchange for uh, for one a Russian spy that comes up again, and he says he says, "Oh no, it's just one transaction." <laughs> <laughs> well, you know these lawyers. <laughs> you have to be a lawyer to pick up on that, I think. <laughs> well, I you know, but but. To, to that point, though, I thought probably the most remarkable part of the movie, I really would be interested in your thoughts about it, is when he was negotiating with the Russians, um, and he, he didn't know who he was dealing with. He didn't know who was who, uh, and he would figure out it was a moving target, and he had to you know, examine the, the authority of the individual he was with and somehow penetrate um, you know, that, that level of... Uh, uh, you know, vagueness that they threw on. He really didn't know who had authority to make a deal. And that, to me, that was, you know, it was just like um, he was learning on the job how to be a real negotiator, a real spy uh, in, in an international sense, in a very difficult, dangerous environment. And uh, remarkable that he would do that. What? What spy? And, you know, he was at risk. He was at risk. Even that um, altercation on the street, uh, where those young fellows in uh, East Berlin attacked him, took his overcoat. Remember that? They set that up. That was not an accident. They were softening him up. And so, you know, he was in a, a time of great um, risk, great threat. But he managed. I guess it really takes a an insurance defense lawyer to be able to handle that kind of thing. <laughs> it's, it's too credit to, to the profession, you know. When Michael? When he was uh, doing those negotiations, there were two countries that he was dealing with. He was dealing with a, an East German lawyer and a Russian KGB chief. So the KGB chief could negotiate for um, powers, but the, the, we didn't recognize East Germany. East, East Germany wanted recognition in the world, but they were under the thumb of the Soviet Union, but they weren't recognized as a sovereign state by the United States. And they had Tyre, the kid. And so they were trying to just engineer powers for Pryor, but uh, the Pryor was a, was a low-level thing, just a kid power. I mean, uh, Abel was the top chief so you want to you want to get a top person in res in response and so that's why powers was so important but the soviet so he, he had to deal with the so many different levels he had to deal with the soviet union and the, and the east germany and then his own government that sometimes would try to undermine him uh but he insisted that there be a two for one and he actually got that two for one um you know, the, getting back to lawyers, the the there are two books that are the major books about this exchange. One is James Donovan's book called Strangers on a Bridge, and the other was Bridge of Spies by Giles Whittle. And when we first talked about this, I went and found and, and read Bridge of Sp Spies by Giles Riddle. And then I realized that's not what the movie was based on. It was based on Donovan's book. And Giles Riddle wound up suing Spielberg for taking his name and putting his, his book name on, the, on, the, uh, on this movie. And I never could find out what happened. And I just assumed what happened was that uh, they settled the thing. And I'm sure Giles got a good settlement out of that because he just took his name. I mean, Bitch of Spies was his book. Uh, the difference in the book is, is like this movie, it's primarily, uh, the Donovan's book is primarily about his representation of Abel and engineering the exchange. Whereas The Bridge of Spies is much deeper about the whole story at all levels, 
I mean, he goes back into the history of the Soviet uh, spying, spying on our nuclear things, going back to the Rosenbergs, and then much more detail on powers and the story. So it's great to read both books. They're, they're complementary of one another. Um, uh, another thing, uh, Jacqueline and I were talking earlier about uh, the judge that handled the case of, uh, of Abel. Oh, and, wasn't he the pits, wasn't he? Oh, well, the actual judge was, uh, he'd been on the bench for several decades, and he was a highly respected judge, and he would never have done or allowed what happened in this movie, which didn't happen, by the way, where Donovan goes to his residence and has an ex parte communication with him. Oh, yeah. Oh, and, yeah. And, and tried to convince him not to give the death penalty because he wants— uh, he thinks in the future that Abel Abel could be exchanged for some other person in the future that we could get back, and that never happened. It never happened. In fact, what ha it happened in the courtroom, and during his argument on sentencing, he made a plea uh, that there might be a time in the future when we'll want to get uh, somebody back that they got that's high level, and we've got powers and we can exchange them. So that that never happened, and. I mean, the ex parte didn't happen, and, and it never would have happened. Uh, it would have been t entirely inappropriate. Yeah, but, he, uh, um, I I am wondering about um, you know the public reaction. This was in the time of McCarthy, and um, <clears throat> Donovan was being criticized. His his uh, home was attacked. Uh, his kids were attacked in school uh, for representing a spy. Uh, and that was this kind of McCarthy-esque, wasn't it? And not that that wouldn't happen again today. I think it might. Um, but I think that was a sign of the times. That's what we had in the Cold War. That's what we had about these filthy pinko communist people. Um, that was, a, you know, the American reaction to the Cold War, although we were also involved in the Cold War. Um, your thoughts, Shackley? Oh, well, i uh... Uh, a couple of things I'll mention uh, that I thought of as I was watching. First off, there are a number of interviews of Steven Spielberg and others and Tom Hanks and so on on YouTube for anybody who's interested. And they talk about a lot about how they put this movie together, which is very interesting. A um, couple of things is um, I was in Moscow once and I went to the military museum there and they have, I saw over in the corner was this big pile of junk and I walked over there. And it turns out that was what was left of Gary Powers' U2. They kept it. So I've actually seen the U2. Um, what else was it going to say? Uh, your question was about the times. Yeah, you know, like we've covered with you guys, we've covered the, the greatest generation in World War II. Uh, a couple of expressions of that. And Spielberg and uh, Tom Hanks, um, you know, mm -hmm. they collaborate on that. Kind of thing, uh, saving Pri Private Ryan would be another one, um, but um, this was not World War II. This was not the the common definition of the um, greatest generation, and somehow yet it's connected. Don't you agree? Uh, it's um, well, yeah. I mean, if the after the immediate aftermath of World War II was the beginning of the Cold War, right? So this was the worst part of the Cold War, the coldest part, if you will. Uh, and then, and, you know, in those days, I remember when the Berlin, when the Berlin wall fell and the end of the Soviet union, I didn't believe it was happening. People came and told me, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's over. I said, no, no, that's impossible. <laughs> but, but I got what happened. And, and then we went, you know, we thought everything was going to be rosy and, and Russia was going to be a democracy and all this stuff. Turns out that was dead wrong. And uh, and we're still living with the consequences of that. And we've got we're almost back where we were uh, in the times of the Cold War. Although nobody seems to be particularly worried about a nuclear attack these days, uh, we're here to talk about it. But um, it th there isn't there isn't the same sort of concerns that we had it during the Cold War period about uh, being at risk for a nuclear war. Yeah, I can remember. Uh, I, 
early in the 60s when it was really the height of the fears. Uh, you know, I had, you, my, my dad was in the Pentagon, which everyone always calls as ground zero. That's where the, the Russian bomb will come down. And so we lived right across the river in Arlington and I had a go-to bag and my dad had a place for us to go, all go to in West Virginia, going over the Appalachians to be on the other side of the, the blast. And if, if he called us and said, go, we were, I just grabbed my go-to bag and we got in the car and we would go to this place in West Virginia. So he knew where we were, but he was in ground zero at the Pentagon. It was that serious. People were building um, underground bomb t uh, shelters all over the United States. Um, we, we were all fearful of, uh, of, of a nuclear war. And, and, but I think that there's so much parallels to the day because we're back into another Cold War. Well, is this, how is this one different than that one? Uh, you know, I mean, for example, um, what I read, last couple of days about how somehow the pilot um, that uh, took the uh, Russian jet into Spain uh, mysteriously died. And uh, there have been so many other assassinations and poisonings and what have you, including Navalny, of course, but, you know, many others around the world. And Putin is not the only one who does that. And so, um, you know, I, I, w I would say that the Cold War now is more high tech, although certainly the U two, as Shackley said, was very high tech. But then you know the Russians were more high tech. They could reach him at seventy thousand feet, and the, and nobody in the U.S. intelligence knew that. They found out the hard way. But I feel that the the technology now is is more. Uh, for example, those microwaves on sixty minutes. Um, though, you know that's really high tech. We don't understand that yet. Uh, I mean, we don't understand how to defend against it. And there's so many things happening now that, um, yes, you can make the parallel, but how does it compare in terms of risk? And as Shackley pointed out also, um, we could have a nuclear confrontation now. Remember, this was only a year away uh, from the uh, Bay of Pigs. Um, and, uh, and, and, of course, the, the showdown with Kennedy uh, about you know, nuclear weapons at Cuba. Uh, so uh, it, it's not impossible. It could happen. Maybe we have to tell our kids about duck and cover. Here's a couple of factoids. The second U-2 shoot down was during the uh, Bay of Pigs or during the Cuban Missile Crisis. There was another one shot down and the pilot killed. Donovan was actually, uh, during the Kennedy administration, he, he was asked by President Kennedy to go to Cuba to negotiate the repatriation of the people who were picked up uh, and imprisoned uh, as a result of the Bay of Pigs and, and some others. And he did that. And he was able to obtain the release of about 9,000 people, men and women and children uh, from Cuba. So this, he was quite a guy, you know, he, he had this amazing career where he really made a tremendous contributions to our country. Great patriot. You know, back then, Jay, um, this is late 50s, um, 1960, John Kennedy, one of the reasons he was elected because uh, there was a belief that there was what they call a missile ca uh, gap, that the, the Russians had way more missiles than we did. And so we were at great risk. Turned out it was all bogus. It wasn't true. Uh, I'm not blaming Kennedy because the... the CIA put that out, intentionally put it out, because they wanted that. Um, but there was no missile gap. They were way behind us. But today, Putin's not only threatening to use nuclear weapons in the Ukrainian uh, conflict, and also if NATO gets involved, uh, but he's even threatened to put nuclear weapons on satellites. And we've, we've had agreement from day one that we're going to denuclearize space. We weren't going to take weapons into space, but, um, you know, some of that may be off the table. And, and if that's, I mean, if he, if he puts nuclear weapons in space, I mean, talk about danger. We're all at really at risk. You know, when, um, uh, 
uh, Tom Hanks and and Steven Spielberg collaborated on World War II movies. Um, they were trying to send a message, I think. Um, the message gets clearer now because this is uh, 2015. They made the movie. And that was after Maiden Square in Kiev. Um, that was after, you know, Eastern Europe was becoming uh, unstable. Um, that was after Putin was becoming very aggressive. And I believe that they were making this movie not just for an historic, um, you know, review adventure, not just to make a, a, doc, a documentary docudrama kind of movie. I think just as in the other movies around World War II, they were trying to tell us something. They were trying to give us a takeaway. They were trying to educate the public about something they thought was important. Both Tom Hanks, if you've ever, well, you've seen interviews with him, and Spielberg, you don't have to see a lot of interviews to know where those guys are coming from. Um, they're super patriots, and they want to celebrate this kind of patriotism. But what do you think they intended to convey in this movie? Um, I'm asking for either of you to respond to that. Boy, I, beyond what the story itself was about, I mean, I mean, it, it's it's a it's a worrisome story for the reasons you just mentioned that. You know, we're still at, at nuclear loggerheads, and we have China now involved, uh, which we didn't have during the Cold War. Um, and so I, I guess in a way it's a kind of a warning. Um, though times are so different, you know, uh, people don't seem to take it as seriously. I, and I don't, perhaps we should, and maybe that's that's how the movie can help. Well, he's, and also... Uh, Spielberg said, I made the movie because it was a bloody good story. <laughs> <laughs> well, not, you know, yes, of course, but it's within his, I know. his ambit. You know? I know, it is, but he loved doing it. And, and he did it with great realism. The, the uh, U-2 in there was, was a real U-2 at, at Beale Air Force Base. Uh, the only thing digital in the whole movie was when they shot down the, the U-2 and it blew up. Everything else was real. Uh, they built they built the wall. X would go by on a train, and he looked out and see people trying to get, breach the wall. Well, they they built a styrofoam wall, looked like a concrete wall that went for three quarters of a mile, they, and it, it was so real. Um, the uh, the street scene with those thugs it actually happened. That actually happened, except they didn't steal his coat. That he threw that in. Uh, People did shoot into his house. There were there were bullets that came through the window of his house. There were uh, so many levels of this movie were completely realistic, and so I think that's what brings the authenticity so well home in this movie. Because it's it's a thing to really learn from. Yeah, exactly. Certainly. Exactly. Those parts were filmed in East Berlin, apparently, uh, which was still pretty run down at the time. The uh, the the bridge where the exchange took place, the Glenicky Bridge, that's the bridge over the Havel River between Potsdam and Berlin. And uh, I've actually been there. You could you can go there now, and it's a bit. It's interestingly, it's about two kilometers from where the Wannsee Conference was held in the estate uh, on the Wannsee. Uh, area of Berlin, where the uh, the final solution was determined by the leaders of the Nazi party. Yeah. And, yeah. It was so realistic to actually be on the bridge during that exchange. I mean, it, it was the tensest part of the whole movie because it came so close to being, to falling apart because it, Friar was being released to Checkpoint 2 or Charlie, and so he had to get word that that tr that the prior was being released, and the the government agent was telling Donovan, and this actually happened. He says, "We got powers. Let's just switch." He says, "No, I'm waiting for I'm waiting for prior," and he says, "No, just do it." And he says, "No, I'm waiting." And uh, according to the book, uh, what they they believe was the East German government held. Prior back just to sort of stick a finger in our eyes 
uh, and 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 throw a monkey wrench into the whole thing. And by the way, it the dr the dramatic nighttime scene didn't happen. It happened about eight eight forty five in the morning, so it wouldn't have been quite as dramatic. Have, having it there in a Casablanca, uh, foggy airport type scene, you know that being on that bridge in the dark and it's kind of cold and foggy th that gave it even more realism. Even though that's not exactly how it. Came down. I don't know. It's oh, like February, February in Northern Europe would have been pretty grim looking. <laughs> I'm, I'm reminded uh, that um, um, Spielberg made uh, uh, Schindler's List, mm -hmm. which was a towering film, a towering education for people, a towering education for those who might deny or question the Holocaust. Um, he was doing that for a reason. It was so powerful, that movie. And and I suspect that at this point in his filmmaking career, um, he always wants to send a message. You know, he can afford to do that, essentially. One, one thing that came up in the movie that, that I'd be interested in your guys' opinion is I got the impression that the that the the um action between the uh, Soviet representative and the East German of Ogle, the so called lawyer for, for the family. Uh, that that was orchestrated. That they they deliberately picked up prior, uh, just and uh, because uh, the way it looks in the movie anyway, they picked him up about the time that Hanks arrived uh, in in uh, Berlin, and so they were orchestrating kind of a Mutt and Jeff routine uh, uh, between uh, uh, Powers and uh, Prior. In uh, in negotiating with Hanks, I don't know if you if you guys got that. No, no question about it. Because re remember, he was also negotiating with uh, Abel's wife and cousin, this guy named Drews, and they were neither. They were complete phonies. They were put up by the Soviets, and so the Soviets were using everybody. So they they set up these this the so called wife and the cousin. Uh, and Vogel was the attorney represent, representing. I mean, there wasn't any aspect of that from the Soviet side that wasn't orchestrated. So Great. wheels within wheels. Who do you Great. trust? If if I had to pick one word, you know, to try to get through the the what I call the fog of of espionage, I would pick the word trust. Who exactly do you trust? Because the stakes are so high, uh, no, especially on the, the bridge. It also shows what a what a great negotiator Donovan was, you know, to be able to manage all that and pull it off successfully. Even though the the uh, CIA guys were uh, focused focused on the on the exchange of able able for powers and didn't care so much about prior, according to the movie anyway. Uh, they don't come off that well in the movie and probably in the book. Um, they were pushing him around and he was standing fast. He comes off stronger than they they were. So, um, what, 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 what are you left with on this, and what rating would you give this on a, a scale of one to ten, and maybe beyond? Uh, Michael, you first. I've got to give it a ten plus uh, on character characterization. I, I mean, it, it, as I mentioned, I think it was a character thriller, psychological thriller. The cinematography and the realism uh, of Everything, the U2, the the wall, the bridge, uh, when he had to cross over into East Germany and he stood in a long line and it was freezing cold, um, the tension, it, it, and there was sort of a darkness when they went into the second half of the movie and he's working in East Germ Germany and in East Germany, you, you get this dark pallor to the thing. It's it's no longer colorful. It's You can feel feel like you're in East Germany and after the war when everything was so subdued and the Soviets are in charge and uh, and and it, it, it's fraught with danger. So uh, the the writing, the music, the cinematography, and mostly the characters, and I'm I'm saying Tom Hanks and Rylance, these are the, one of the greatest acting you'll ever see on Selama. Yeah, Ryland's so understated. 
so powerful. I actually liked him. I actually liked him. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And why that? He was likable. I like that. I like that phrase. On the, the phrase he works in there's striking music about stand up man. How that how they work that into the into the film, and he, he compliments Tom Hanks at the end with that comment. Very appropriate. It was just be beautifully written, beautifully done, and uh, imp- ve- I mean, it's true. It's a true story. Very important history. I think everybody should see this movie. We were just Mike and I were talking before we started about how we don't people don't know enough of our history. Uh, to uh, be able to manage the present effectively. And history simply repeats itself over and over and over again. How does, how does this help, Shackley? How does this movie help us manage the present? Well, it provides information so that you can see what things actually were really like. I mean, it's not made up. This is the truth. This actually happened. And, uh, and things like that are happening now. I mean, but, but then there was a big exchange uh, in the Ukraine situation, remember uh, uh, one of Putin's pals was exchanged for uh, uh, for someone, and uh, and the, the, you know there was that exchange for that young woman basketball player, and they're trying to and they're trying to do an exchange. Uh, who is it? Uh, Tucker Carlson was trying to ask Putin to release the the Wall Street Journal reporter. You know that this goes on all the time. This is real life, and uh, we we shouldn't forget that. And and uh, well, the, the my my main is as an old man now. I I really fear that yet younger people, especially in America, we just don't we don't have enough appreciation for how bad things can really get in a real in a real hurry. And um, I just hope that uh, uh, we don't have anything bad happen. Well, and we have to appreciate the nuance. You know, this movie, you, know, you don't hate the Russians. You don't hate the East Germans. They're bad, but you don't hate them. They're people. And and I think that Spielberg did achieve that. He showed you the reality of the, the human condition on both sides of the wall. I, I'm sorry, Michael. Go ahead. Well, you just pointed out something that, that, that just occurred to me when I was in Russia about 12, 10 years ago on a river cruise. Uh, I found all the Russian people just like us. They, they, I mean, they were just people. They, they'd be somebody you, you'd meet in Alabama or California or New Jersey. Uh, and one of them, one of the, t- the tour guides, Russian, said after about a week and a half of our tour, he said, you know, have, have you realized that we are more alike than not? And that Maybe it's our politicians that should be fighting. <laughs> that, that's a remarkable statement. <laughs> that's the life. And I just, I, I came away. They're just ordinary people. All the Russians I met were ordinary people. I want to make one other comment that I, that I meant to add was there's a subtle level of comedy in this film uh, that the Kahn brothers were, were largely responsible for. And I'll give you one example, and it's just, it's, but it's very subtle. They're in the court, and uh, Hanks comes back after a court conference, and he's gotten some bad news back there, and he sort of tells him, you know, it's not going so well. And then he then he looks at uh, Rylance and says, uh, don't you ever worry? And just without, very subdued, without, spinning, uh, without a break, Rylance looks up and says, would it help? Right. He does he does that more than once during the month. Yes. Would it help? <laughs> so, Shackley, we, we missed your rating. We got to close now, but what is your rating on this movie? Oh, that's an excellent movie. 10 plus. Everyone should see it. I agree with you guys. 10 plus. Thank you very much, Mike Lilly, Shackley with Fedo. Great discussion. Important that we appreciate this. Aloha. Aloha. 
We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.